Wow, no pulpit. <laughs> you know, it makes me think, uh, the, what? Oh. <laughs> I triple checked. I want you guys to know, but. <laughs> That's all right. It goes both ways. I remember the very first time that I ever taught in an environment like this where I had this kind of music stand, I was so nervous because, you know, a pulpit at least gives you some protection. You can dive behind it if you have to or whatever. And, and I had one that didn't really adjust all the way, and, and I was being videotaped, and I kept doing this up and down because I was nervous. I didn't even notice it. We watched it later. It looked like I was pumping up a tire. <laughs> I was up there the whole time like this. So I'm going to try not to do that tonight. Uh, not that I'm not nervous, but hey, uh, let's just ask the Lord to bless the time that we have and uh, thank Him for wh what He's doing here. Father, it is an amazing thing uh, just to be even surrounded in this environment by all the things that the kids are enjoying. And Lord, we're just your kids. We're just big kids. We, we need uh, instruction for you. And you've brought each one of us here for uh, the same basic purpose, which is to get to know you or to get to know you better. For those of you those of us who already know you, Lord, you're just uh, wanting to draw us nearer to you. And if there be any in this room here who have not yet come into a saving knowledge of your son, Lord, I pray that this would be their day, just a, a time for you to make all things clear and obvious to them from your word. And we thank you for an opportunity to look at your scriptures here tonight because you have preserved them for this purpose, to change our lives and to give us the abundant life that we so desperately need and only you can give. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are at, as you know, the end of the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. And as you can see from the slides that are up here, the theme of this book has been higher ground. And it's really about living above that level of mediocrity, you know, above the earthly level, to actually have a spiritual life that goes from glory to glory, as the Bible puts it. And as we think of the theme, of higher ground, I want to put a picture here in your mind, which is imagine yourself hiking to the top of Mount Everest. That's the highest mountain in the world, the highest spot on earth, and it's 29,000 feet above sea level. Along the way, uh, if you were to take that trip, you would probably wonder, was this worth it? You know, why did I do this? Was the trip worth the time? And you would wonder if you were going to even live to see the top of that peak. And so along the way, maybe it would occur to you what a long, strange trip it's been. And then finally, there it is, the peak, the pinnacle, the top of the mountain, the higher ground that you had been hiking and hoping for. And as you look closer, you notice there in the distance a vending machine. A vending machine at the top of Mount Everest? Hey, I told you we're using our imagination here. That's what this is about. So even from that distance, you can tell that that vending machine is packed with all your favorite snacks and drinks. And so you get a little extra burst of energy, picking up the pace there at the last part of that peak, thinking about what's in store for you. But as you draw closer, as you get nearer, you realize there's a handwritten sign on the front of that vending machine. Sorry, out of order. <laughs> out of order? Well, how would you feel at that moment? As you put that picture in your mind, I'm sure there would be disappointment, there would be frustration, there might even be anger. I don't know if you've ever assaulted a vending machine before when it took your quarter or whatever, but that would certainly be a time where you say, I wonder how far this thing could fly off the mountain if you were to shake it. And so I titled tonight's teaching, Out of Order. Why? Well, we've all seen that sign on soda machines, ATM machines, photocopiers, gas pumps, even public restrooms. I thought it was great irony here. I walked into our own men's bathroom here, and for the first time that I can ever remember, there was a sign that said, sorry, out of order. I guess the kids kind of put it through its paces today or whatever, and that was too much for it with the VBS. But we know what that sign means when we see it. Something isn't working properly. Something is in need of service and failing to function as it was designed. And so it means we aren't going to get what we need, what we want, what we expected out of that thing. When something's out of order, well, on the one hand, it can be just a minor inconvenience, but it can get to be a major disaster. And I suggest here tonight that we might need to hang that sign on the door of many modern homes, out of order. 
When it comes to marriages, when it comes to parenting, jobs, even our personal priorities, things are often out of order, not working properly, in desperate need of some service, failing to function as God designed. And so you need to know this first of all, that God is a God of order, that He is one who brings order out of chaos. And so the world was made to work a certain way. He has a design, a divine design. And when things get out of that order that God gives, well, it won't work right. Life fails to function. It breaks down. And so sad to say, again, many Christian homes are just as out of order as heathen homes. Now, why is that? Well, I think there's at least two main reasons. And the first is ignorance. You know, People come to Christ and maybe they don't right away know that God has an order, that he has a different order than the way the world teaches and knows. And so there can be that ignorance. I didn't know. And there's nothing wrong with that. God has an order. Oh, I didn't know. I was ignorant of that. God has a way. Yes, it's seen in Ephesians 5 and 6 as uh, two of the spots where it lays it out very clearly, God's order in our lives. But the second reason is a little more troubling. For others, it's not ignorance, it's ignore ants. You know, it's a different way of emphasizing that, ignore ants. Well, what I mean by that is, I know what the Word says, but I ignore it. You know, I, I'm not ignorant of it, but I am ignoring it. I think I know better. I think I know a different way. And, and really, that is the greater danger, maybe, for many in this room who would call themselves Christians, myself included, that we'd say, you know what, I know it, but I don't do it. Because so often it's not that we don't know what to do, it's that we don't do what we know. And so whether through ignorance or ignorance, when we fail to put God's word into practice practically, day to day, our lives can quickly get out of order. Our relationships can get out of order. And so a good question to consider tonight is if, if your life is chaotic, if it's out of order, if it's dysfunctional, are you really putting into practice what God's Word says so clearly? Uh, it, see, the thing is, the good news is that it doesn't have to be out of order. Your life doesn't have to be out of order. Ephesians 6 is exactly about putting it back into order, into the order that God had as his divine design. Now, of course, many Christians want to change the world, but as the saying goes, if you want to change the world, Sometimes you have to start at home. And so let's look at a very practical chapter here that does start exactly there in the home. Ephesians 6, verse 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now, just thinking about some quick contrast there, you have in order. What is in order? Children, obey your parents. That's God's order. What's out of order? Parents, obey your children. You know, some, some of the kids say, hey, I like that one. Where's that one found? Well, it's not found here. You're not going to find it. You can look through the scripture. You're not going to find it. Now, as I teach on the subject of family and parenting, it's a pretty dangerous thing to do. Why? Two of my kids are in this room. At least they better be. Two of the three, are they there? I think Stephen's over there. Bethany's somewhere in here. Oh, oh, kids ministry serving. Now that's good. Okay, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully that's what she's doing. Now, let me make the disclaimer up front. We do not pretend to be perfect parents, and we certainly don't have perfect kids. And anyone who knows them uh, or knows us knows that both of those are true. Now, here's the thing. I threatened our kids uh, before we left home to make sure that they would at least be on their best behavior tonight. So if anyone was paying attention during this study, they'd say, wow, what well-behaved kids. But that was just, uh, you know, that's what death threats will do for a kid. But Somewhere along the line, here's what's happened in our world, which is that some psychologists convinced a lot of American parents that the way to raise kids is to let them do whatever they want. You know, that you want them to have that free spirit. You want them not to have their little self-esteem damaged, you know. And a while back, I read about this, that a whole school system had told the teachers that they could no longer use red pens to correct the kids' papers. Why? Too traumatic. Red, no, too dramatic. What you need is a happy color. And so all the teachers were told, you have to use a purple pen. I'm not making this up. And so they would mark them with a purple pen, a little smiley face. You know, an F is still an F in whatever color you get it. You know, it may be a happy F, but it's still an F when you bring it home. And so 
From that school of thought and from that kind of thing, you see so many parents think, this is what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be their buddy. And so they have that thing out of order. Parents, obey your children. You know, whatever your kids want, that's what they need to have. And so, out of order. And the problem is, if your car fires the cylinders out of order, you know what happens? It backfires. And if you order your home out of order, you know what happens? It backfires. You think you're going to be their buddy, you end up being their worst enemy. See, our kids knew right away in, in, in the Bible where Ephesians 6.1 was. Before they could even really uh, find other scriptures, we made sure this one was highlighted. You know, give your kid a Bible and have this one highlighted already. Here's, here's a gift. Write it from mom and dad, Ephesians 6.1, you know. Make them memorize it early. And I'll never forget this. It's kind of funny. Again, there's, there's what we know and, and what we do, and sometimes the two don't always add up. And I'll never forget this. Our son, Stephen, he's 14 now. Uh, but he was, when he was three years old, I came into the living room one day, and there he was pacing back and forth, not on the floor, but on the coffee table. Now, I don't know about the rules that you have at your house, but that's one at our house, that the coffee table's for coffee. Well, actually, it's not even for that. It's for... Nothing. You're supposed to just have it there and not touch it, you know. But, <laughs> but there he is walking back and forth. Now, that's bad enough, but here's the great irony of it. He had in his hand his Sunday school papers with his memory verse. What was it? Ephesians 6.1. <laughs> Children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. And there he is walking on the coffee table disobeying his parents. Now, I didn't know whether to discipline him or, or to congratulate him on his great memory of the verse. But as we think about that example, again, knowing a truth is not really as important as doing a truth. Obviously, you can't, know what, no, you can't do what you don't know. But it's so important that you can't not do what you know. The Lord says, hey, we need to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And so, again, we aren't perfect parents. We aren't perfect people. That's the very reason everyone in this room, wherever your life circumstance finds you, as a child, as a parent, as a parent-to-be, as a grandparent, as an aunt, as an uncle, whatever it is, we need to order our lives in God's way because the only other alternative is to be out of order. And I can safely say that for the most part, our house is generally in order rather than out of order. To our glory? No. To God's glory. Because see, the thing is, we know what it is to have out of order things too. And we know what it is to try to do things our way and it didn't work and it doesn't work. And so we have become more and more over the years committed to ordering our home God's way. And so it starts right there in the house with that children obey. Well, it simply says it's right. That's the reason, you know, and that's the parental prerogative, right? As a parent, sometimes kids will say, well, why? Because I'm the parent. That's why. Now that's kind of what God's word does first. He just says, hey, it's right. Just do it. But he goes on to actually give reasons and rewards that may go well with you and you may live long. Now, you know, as some parents have that kind of mentality where they say, look, kid, I brought you into this world. I can take you right back out. You know, and, and, the, and you're saying, is that what it's saying here? Well, you sort of. I mean, in the Old Testament, in fact, a consistently rebellious child would be stoned. And I'm not talking about stone like people talk about it today. Stoned to death. Now, that would tend to quiet things down on those cross-country trips, right? I mean, you know, when you tell the kids, look, not I'm going to pull you over and spank you. I'm going to pull you over and stone you. I'm going to leave you as a little memorial on the side of the road. <laughs> but a, a command to a child, realize this, a command to a child is really a command to an adult. It's really a command to a parent. See, when it says children obey, you know what it's really saying at the heart of it? It's saying parents teach your children to obey. Teach your children well. When we have baby dedications here, and we love to do that, you know what, it's really one of the things we tell the parents. It's you who's being dedicated. I know everyone's here to see the baby, and it's so cute and everything. Ah, isn't that sweet? But the truth is, that baby isn't making any dedication or declaration. That baby doesn't have the capacity to do that. It's the parents saying, we are dedicating our lives. We're going to dedicate our lives so that this child might be brought up in a Christian home that's in order, not out of order. Now, what's going on here is that the, this section, I think it's interesting to see, comes after Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Now, that's a, 
a portion of scripture that, I, that I'm really glad Pedro's going to cover because that's kind of a minefield all its own, you know, like this. Uh, you can certainly make some people angry with talking about parenting and all the rest, but you can really get it going with the marriage stuff. So uh, he'll be hitting that and, and all that. But, but recognize this, that it follows something that describes submission, but this is really important. It's submission not only of wives, but husbands, and he'll bring that out, I'm sure. But uh, uh, Lukey will make sure that he does, because if he doesn't, he'll be in trouble. But it says submission to the, the husband. Well, that's the husband there also submitted to God, and that's how you have an in-order home. See, anything other than that, than mutual submission, really, to God and to each other, is really going to be out of order also. And so... You know, I do a lot of relationship counsel. I like doing it. I, I really like meeting with people and, and sharing with them God's truth because I like to see lives get in order. You know, God has done so many miracles when you just see the simple truths. Again, sometimes just people not knowing these things, as soon as they see the truths, God brings them to light in their life. But it's a common complaint that people have. Hey, my marriage isn't working. My marriage isn't working. You know, they come in and it, it's like they've hung the sign over it, you know, over their spouse's head, out of order. This, this person's messed up. Throw them away. Get a new one, you know, in our disposable society. But God really doesn't want us just to throw that away, but to fix it, to have him fix it. And the question that I always ask people is, have you really put things in God's order? Have you really put your lives in God's order? Have you, have you mutually submitted to him, first of all, and then seeking to submit to one another, as you see in the scripture? So if that's the order, when that's the order, it's amazing how many problems that fixes. And this is the order that the Bible lays out, and it's even right here in this section of Scripture. It's God first. You see that way back in Ephesians 5.18. It talks about that. Then it goes on to talk about spouses, and then it now talks about kids, and then it'll go on to talk about career. And again, if you were to think about that in a priority order, you got God, spouse, kids, career. And if you just mentally think through it, you can say, well, am I in order? Am I out of order? Is that something that makes sense? Because you flip-flop any of those things in there and you'll start having trouble. And so, so often I hear people say this, we're staying together for the kids. And I think, yikes. You know, you're, you're probably not doing the kids any favor. You're certainly not impressing God with that. Here's the thing. Staying together for the kids? See, the best thing you can do for your kids is not just to stay together miserable. No, to actually get things in order, you know, so that what you can do is have a life that's in order, submitted to God, submitted to one another. That's what's really going to bless the kids. Loving God and one another. And husbands, the Bible says, love your wife sacrificially. Uh, you know, it's rare that I've ever seen uh, that a, a woman who won't respond to a guy who will truly love her sacrificially and lead sacrificially in the home. And then you see of course, that respect of the husband's leadership. That's the order. And again, it sounds simple, and I'm not here to say, hey, we've got it all down. I mean, I do, Lynn's still working on it. You know, but, but until, and, whoa, I shouldn't have said that without the pulpit here, you know, but, but until we get this straight, and, and as we get this straight, it's really a waste of time to talk about proper parenting because that's the first example that they need to see. They need to be able to see in their home. Kids need to see in their home. What's a godly man look like? Well, he looks like dad. What does a godly woman look like? Well, she looks like mom. And that means that we even make mistakes the way godly moms and dads do, because we do. You know, and, and you may be saying here, well, here's the thing, Scott. I'm a single parent. You know, this is kind of like a Bible study that should have come along earlier in my life or something. Or I'm married to a non-believer, and I'm all over the, the obedience to the Bible, but I can't get them to do it. Well, admittedly, and there's no mincing these words, you know what, your job is twice as hard. Your job's twice as hard. You're going to do the job of two people. But here's the thing. God has promised to be one who gives grace where it's needed. And if grace is ever needed, it's certainly needed in those circumstances. And so the dependence on the Lord is even more important in those cases. And God certainly will honor you as you honor him. But whatever your situation, don't make the mistake of thinking that you can have your life out of order in these ways and it will still work. There was a, an, a great Old Testament picture of this. The, the Old Testament always has these great uh, illustrations for the New Testament principles. And there was a priest in the Old uh, Testament named Eli. And Eli had some rebellious sons, you know. Uh, it's, it's proof obvious that 
just going and being around the temple all the time isn't necessarily going to uh, rub off on them. But you see that God rebuked uh, the sons and he dealt with the sons, but he rebuked Eli in 1 Samuel 2.29. And it's kind of some sobering words. This is what he says. God says to Eli, you got things out of order. This is what he said. You honored your children above me. Like you idolized your kids so much that you actually messed them up. You idolized your kids and you ignored my word and you didn't discipline them. That's what it says there. Oh, I love them too much to discipline them. 1 Samuel 3.13, this is what God went on to say to Eli. You didn't restrain them. You didn't correct them. You didn't discipline them. And they became corrupt and God had to judge them. And you see, Eli was a godly man again, but he didn't live up to his responsibility as a father. And maybe he was a guy who dispensed all kinds of grace and great advice. And that's why I say it's sobering to me because I say, you know what? I want to make sure that I don't just preach without practicing. It's a difficult job to be a parent. And one of the things uh, that I've really been appreciating more and more is my own father in my life. You know, just uh, so many years, uh, I, I thought he was really messed up. And I found out, you know what? Uh, this ain't easy to do. And it's, it's a little illustration that, that teaches us this. I was, uh, when I was growing up, I would watch my dad drive, you know. And uh, it's not always a good idea, actually. You don't always learn good things there. But uh, you learn words that... Uh, that you know, one day our kids, I've got to say this to embarrass our grand, uh, grandfather at some point, which is one day Stephen came home and, and we were uh, in the car and he yelled, hey, move that bucket of bolts, you know, to something. I said, well, where did he learn that? And then, then I was, uh, you know, with Lynn's dad, uh, Bill, and, and he said, move that bucket of bolts, you know, to something to the kid. Oh, that's where he learned it. But, um, but the grandfather's been an excellent, excellent, excellent uh, example in most other ways. But anyway, I was watching my, my dad. I got to be careful. There's just a, could he reach me from there? I don't know. Um, but on the, on the steering wheel, my dad, as he was driving, used to just lift his hand like this all the time. You know, he'd drive down the road and he'd do that. And it's one of those little mysteries from being a kid that you'll see something and you go, why, why is that? Why does he do that? You know, and I never thought to ask or anything, but I just, you know, watch him do this, watch him do this while he's driving. I thought, hmm. And then I turned 16 and I got to drive that same car. And you know what? In a certain range of the speedometer, you couldn't see the speedometer unless you lifted your hand like that. <laughs> And I, the first time I did it, I went, oh, the mystery of the universe has been solved, you know. And so often in life, you find yourself going, why did my parents, oh, that's why my parents, oh, okay, and, you know. Stick around a little longer, you'll see some of those things. And so if you love your children, discipline them, please. You know, teach them to obey you and teach them to obey the Lord and and I, I remember something from a couple's retreat that we went to, and it was just awesome the way the guy said it. He said, our kids are criminals. They're little criminals, you know. He was saying they're at home right now with some babysitter or something while you're here, and they're little criminals, and we need to pray for them. We need to help them have a change of heart. You know, they're just like we were. <gasps> oh, no, you know. And so God here is the perfect parent. It's something that we see. And so, you know, I... That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that look at my example and do it. Look at God's example and do it. We need to learn from him. I need to learn from him. How does God treat his kids? Well, that's what we are. How does he treat his kids? It's incredible, the insight in just this simple little verse here. This has gone so far for me as a parenting tip. James 4, 6. James 4, 6, if you just jot that down quickly, it's such a simple principle. It's amazing. It says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Wow, see, there's a lot of Parents who make the mistake of giving grace to the proud, you know, to the rebellious, and say, oh, well, we just need to give them some grace. No, God gives opposition to the proud. He opposes it. it. The word is stiff arm. That's what it means. He's like, he puts it in the forehead, bong, you know, and that's what he does in our life when we're proud. But if we'll humble ourselves, he gives grace. And so in our house, we always try and ask, what's being exhibited here? Is there an attitude of humility? Well, even if the worst mistakes, whatever they may be, and there are many of them, you know, on our side and there's, hey, humility, well, it rules today. And it's amazing how much grace can be given when there's humility and a desire to change. But when there is rebellion, when there is arrogance, when there is pride, it has to be opposed. It cannot be given grace. And so, you know, in our house, somebody many years ago, again, you walk with the wise, the Bible says, and you will become wise. We didn't have any clue what we were doing. You know, they issue a baby to you and you're like, wow, 
What do I do? <laughs> you know, I remember coming home from Baptist Hospital with the flashers on. You know, I was driving like 15 miles an hour, and I was, uh, you know, yelling at people in Miami. I'm like, "What's the matter with you? You know, there's a baby in here and stuff." And but I remember driving away from the hospital and thinking, "They're letting us leave. They don't have any idea how little we know. I mean, how could they let us go with this baby? I half expected the cops to follow us home and arrest us for you know trying to raise a child without any knowledge at all." But one of the things somebody early on told us is, hey, first time obedience, you got to work on this one. You can't let them win and, and figure out how many rounds you can go because, you know, it's not after I've chased you down and threatened you that, that you finally obey. It's not after you finish two more levels, Dad, on my video game. Just two more, two more. I'm getting the high score, you know, because delayed obedience is still disobedience. And it's just teaching a person that there is a lag time between uh, what I say and, and what you need to do. And I don't want to teach my kids that the first two times I say something can be ignored. Ah, oh, the first two, those are the freebies. It's the third one where he really blows up, you know. Why? Because they'll do the same thing with God. We're training people in everything we do. We're being trained in everything we do. And you know what? God doesn't give me two freebies and then expect me to, oh, Scott, do this uh, on the third try, you know. Yeah, yeah, God, I, I got the high score. Hold on, man. I, I just, I'm doing something here. Just let me finish here, and then I'll, I'll obey you. See, and, and that consistency is so, so important because kids are very, very smart. You know, we think they're dumb. If we think we're dumb, if they're dumb, uh, we're wrong. You know, kids figure us out very quickly. I, I've seen six months old who, who can outsmart their parents very, very quickly, you know. But that, out, uh, that, that united front is so important because to ask your mom, ask your dad. Well, I asked my mom, and, and she said to ask you, and she said it was okay if you said it was okay and all this stuff. And you're like, let's get everybody in the room at the same time. You know, Lynn, what, you know, let's talk about it with the kids, and then we'll go in the other room, and we'll come back with an answer. You know, and that's what we're going to do. And again, the, the, the thought here is consistency uh, because... The way they obey their parents, the way our kids obey us, is the way they'll obey God. And this is a struggle worth having. It's a fight you can't afford to lose for their sake or for your own. And so illustration here, just a beautiful one. I remember James Dobson told this one on a radio program, and uh, maybe many of you know him from Focus on the Family. But he said that early in his life, he worked as a security guard. He, he, that was part of his job, a night watchman. And he said it was at a warehouse. And so he would actually... Uh, have to go from door to door. There were hundreds of doors in this place, and his job was to go from door to door to door to door to make sure that they were all locked like they were supposed to be. And he said, here's the thing. My job, you know, was kind of checking all the doors, but the worst thing that could happen to me is when a door that was supposed to be shut and usually was shut was now all of a sudden open. He said, that was when my heart started racing, and, you know, I, I just... I hated that part of the job. I had to then go in and, and figure out why it was open and what the problem was. And he said, you know, I thought through that, and that's exactly a picture of what kid dumb is all about. You know, the kids are programmed almost by God. And I, you know, I, I'm not so old that I can't remember what it is to be one, and I still have this tendency sometimes, which is to push boundaries. You know, to say, well, why is that door open? Or why is that door closed? And why isn't it open? And, and, and let me check on it, you know? And it was, it was closed last week. Is it still closed, you know? Can I push on that thing? And, and, and that's what kids do is they'll say, well, I know the rule was this last week, but is it the same this week? Is, is, is this a negotiable? Can I push this one? And that's their job. But it's our job as parents to make sure that the doors that should stay shut are shut. And there's nothing more uncomfortable truly in a kid's life though they would never admit it, when a door that was supposed to be closed and was closed last time is open this time, and you go, well, which one is it? I never know. I never know what I can do. So they're going to push the doors. That's all right. It's part of being a kid. But we're going to make sure that those doors that should be shut are shut. And I'd rather they not like me now and come to appreciate me later than vice versa because I know a lot of kids who had cool parents, man, when we were growing up, and I look back now and I think, that wasn't so cool. You know, and some of the things that went on weren't cool at all. And so one of the cruelest things you can do is not teach your kids submission 
and respect for authority. Why? Because if they don't learn it at home, they're going to have to learn it somewhere else. And here's the thing. When a life is out of order, it makes just such a disaster of that life and every life around it. And there's a hard way to learn. See, I think uh, at our house anyway, we try to teach our kids with love. We try to teach them and discipline them with love. But see, the world doesn't love our kids. You know, we wish they did, right? Doesn't everyone love little Boopsie the same way I do? No. That's not Stephen's nickname. That's... <laughs> That's Carissa, I guess, boopsie, you know, or whatever. But, but, you know, we hopefully discipline them in the love. But guess what? The police won't love your kids. You know, I mean, the, the whole day, hey, don't tase me, bro. You know, well, you know what? They're, they're, not, they're not disciplining necessarily with love. You know, we don't use tasers at our house. But, you know, there's tasers and nightsticks and a lot worse out there that somebody might discipline you. And I'm not just talking about the police, too. Sometimes a kid's a real brat, and you just think, that guy needs a good beating, and some kid's going to give it to him, you know? That kid is going to mouth off to the wrong kid, and somebody's going to put him down like they should, you know? And you think about that, and you go, wow, if that person hasn't learned respect for authority at home in love, they're going to learn it. They're going to learn it the hard way. And sin will discipline a person's life in a very unloving way sometimes. And some of the young folks in the room might right now be thinking, man... This is, I don't like this Bible study. You know, I, I shouldn't have come tonight or whatever. <laughs> or you're thinking, Man, you, you know, my parents are clueless. I'm the one who's in church and they're the ones who aren't, you know. Uh, you should go talk to them. But here's the thing. There's nothing that'll get through to a parent quite like a kid who has a relationship with God. We've seen so many parents brought to the Lord uh, through this ministry just simply because there's an amazing group of kids here who are, you know, sometimes putting us to shame, and, and that's good. You know, we, we want that. We desire that. We look on, we say, wow, we have failed as a church if we do not pass the torch. And so we're looking at those things, and we've had people question even, why do you go to all this trouble, you know? Why do you do all this stuff and go to all this work? Why? Because this is the most important thing. You know, this is the most important thing to pass this on to the next generation. And so... You know, you think about this, my kids right now might be saying, oh man, dad's clueless, you know. But I, I, it was Mark Twain who said this, that when he was 15, his dad was a total idiot. And he said, it was amazing. By the time I was 21, my dad was getting smarter. And by the time I was 30, my dad was a genius. Now, you think about that story, it, it wasn't his dad that was changing, it was Mark. It was Mark coming to understand these things. And personally, when I was 15, I thought I knew everything. You know, I really did. I thought, man, my parents are so clueless. But think about this. Jesus was 15 once, and his parents compared to him were very, very clueless. clueless. He really did know everything. I mean, he was God. He knew a lot more than Mary and Joseph, no matter how smart they may have been. And Luke 2.51 says this, as a teenager, as a young man, Jesus was subject to his parents. He was obedient to his parents. He had an in-order life, even though he could have ordered them around even and knew a whole lot more than they did. But part of that knowledge actually was a humility. See, it's not a knowledge that leads to arrogance that God is impressed with. And so God... Here in this picture, even with Jesus, he obeyed and he honored even much less perfect parents than he was. And you, again, may be thinking, well, I don't have kids or I don't want kids or anything else. Well, I, I will remind you, yes, you do. We're a family here and we watch out not only for our own kids, but for each other's kids. And, and years ago, I remember one of the ushers uh, at, over at Calvary Chapel, Miami, a friend of ours, he, he was a single guy at the time, no kids, and and he stopped Stephen there from throwing a football in a busy parking lot. You know, he was like running in between the cars and stuff. And, and uh, this usher stopped him and, and got him. And Stephen went, you're the baddest man. You're not my dad, you know, and kind of let him have it. Well, uh, that ended up with uh, us having a, a discussion, I think. You know, and I think it turned Stephen off to football forever. He actually ended up kind of heading over to basketball, you know, from that experience. But but I think about the parental power, you know, the, the importance that God places on it. He'll, he'll drop things in your mind. He'll show you things. You know, it's amazing because my mom, I, I think of my mom as the original neighborhood watch. You know, she, uh, she was, I think she had the whole neighborhood watching us, you know. And, and, and that's what we have kind of here, hopefully, is that there's a cooperation among the parents. You know, kids, you can't hide around here because I'm not, it's not just me watching. It's a lot of people watching. But why? Because of love. 
because of love. I remember one time I went to uh, 7-Eleven at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, went over to a friend's house and we, well, you know, innocent enough in a sense. I mean, we were going there just for a Slurpee. It was really just a Slurpee. 3 o'clock, you know, teenagers. We weren't supposed to leave the house, but we snuck out. We wanted to get a Slurpee just a few blocks. Next morning, my mom says, how was your Slurpee? I said, what? What's my mom doing up at 3 o'clock? What she, you know, she got the surveillance camera from that place. She has never admitted to this day what it is. I, I'm starting to think maybe it was just the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, word and knowledge there. You know, just a supernatural thing that uh, somehow they know, you know. And so verse 4, it's great because it says, you fathers. You know, it's not just about the kids. You fathers, you do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And I love this because the Bible is always so balanced because, you know, someone could say, yeah, we're going to have an in-order house and everybody's going to do my orders and these are my, and I'm going to rule with an iron hand. He says, wait a minute. Is that how God orders our life? It's not the way God fathers us. And see, here's the thing. If we expect our children to be obedient, what it's saying here is we need to be obedient. If we want them to be in order, well, we need to be in order. That's what it's saying. We discipline our children. Well, that requires discipline in our own life, to be in self-control, to be in the control of the Holy Spirit. And I, I think about it this way, and, you know, I don't always tell so many stories with our kids, but it's a teaching on family, so I guess it's only natural that I would do so. But there was a time when uh, one of our kids, and it happened to be Stephen, was, uh, <clears throat> was pushing my buttons. You know, he's about three years old at the time. Again, this, this is when the times, uh, those are special, special times when you're doing a lot of uh, learning and all this. And, and he was, just, you know, I was trying to do something in the home, a project, and he was just whining and whining and whining and whining and everything. And finally, I turned to him and I stuck my finger in his little face and I said, look, you need to grow up, mister. And then I, it was like God was sticking his finger in my face and he's going, you need to grow up, pastor. You know, and I'm like, oh man, busted. You know, so, so often here I am yelling at a three-year-old that he needs to grow up. <laughs> and he has and he is and I'm proud of him and he's growing up. But you know, you, you see those things, if our world is out of order, if our world is out of order, there's no way we're going to be able to bring order into our homes. And the world is more out of order than ever. I mean, I, I look at it and, you know, we used to, when I was growing up, people used to say, oh, you kids have it so good. It was so hard when we were kids. But you know what? I think this is a generation that I can honestly say there's a flip-flop to that. Yeah, I, I think this generation has a very tough task. I believe personally we're living in the last days and I look at that and I say the last days are going to be some tough days. The Bible says that they would be. And I look at these things and I say, you know what, I think we actually had it a little easier when I was growing up than the kids have it today. Not necessarily physically or materially. In many ways, the real issue, man, is the spiritual temptation level is just unbelievable. I mean, Facebook, we didn't have Facebook, MySpace, we didn't have any of that stuff. We didn't have a pipe you know, a big, huge T1 line pumping filth into our house every single day. If I wanted something, you know, sinful, I had to kind of work hard to find it, you know. <laughs> and now it's like it chases you. It pumps up. I don't even, you don't even want it. It's still there. And so in your face. And so this generation, like none other, hey, we need our homes in order because the world is going to be very out of order for them. And that's why... I love the words of Joshua, as he said it in the 24th chapter. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's all I know. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And parents so often use this argument. I hope it's no one in this room that, that has this mentality, but they'll say, you know, I don't bring my kids to church. I don't force them to go to church because, you know, I want them to make their own decisions about faith. I want it to be their own thing. And, and so mommy and daddy are going to go to church now and, and, and you know, do you want to go or you don't want to go? Or would you rather stay here and watch some, you know, TV while we're gone or whatever? Let them decide for themselves. Is that really that smart? I mean, think about it. Do you do that with school? Do you do that with regular school? I, want them, I don't want them to hate math, so I don't make them go to school. I don't want them to hate English, so I, you know, I let them decide if they want to go to school or not. Personal hygiene, I don't want them to grow up hating brushing their teeth, so I just let them decide whether they want the plaque to stay or not, you know? showers. Oh, I don't want them to be afraid of water. I want them to make their own decisions of how important it is to get clean. 
Are you kidding me? We don't do that in any other area of our lives. Listen, what's so encouraging to me, you know, we have had to force our kids at various times to come to church, but you know what they do today? They beg to come. They beg to come and they serve at different services. And again, is that to our glory? No, to God's. It's just the order that he said. You order your life, I'll honor it. And again, these can be tough topics because sometimes people say, I didn't do it right, or it's too late for me, or my kids are messed up, or whatever else, or I tried to do my best, I still don't understand what's going on here. Well, think about this for a moment as we bring that section to a close. Even the perfect parent, which is God, had rebellious kids. He had prodigals. You think about it, his perfect environment, perfect home, perfect garden for Adam and Eve, and they still messed it up. So, you know, as you look at that, it's no it's no automatic protection of these things but what it is is it is a truth that when you raise up a child they'll at least know as they're out in the pig pen that there's a different way to live and sometimes the pig pen has to do its work but you see this in order thing children obey your parents and then as he goes from the home he goes now and turns to the work world and so you see it in verse 5 it says bond servants be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. Now, again, looking at the contrast here, what is it in order? Everyone ought to be able to stick that bumper sticker that maybe you've seen that says, my boss is a Jewish carpenter on their car. I work for Jesus. Whatever you do, you work for Jesus. Out of order? Well, it's, I work for jerks. I work with jerks. I am surrounded by jerks, and so I'm going to work like a jerk too. You see, it's really hard to live our Christianity at home. That's true. Uh, but it's even harder still to take it outside that circle and live it out there in the real world. And there are a lot of jerks out there. You know, in one place, the Corinthians in the scripture were described as always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And you think, man, I must work with uh, co-workers, Corinthians. You know, they're probably from there. Always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That's them. And some of you would say, well, Scott, you know, this is easy for you to talk about. I mean, you work at a church, right? I mean, there's no lazy gluttons around here or evil beasts or or liars or any of the rest of that. But see, I've been working since I was a teenager, roughly, you know. Fast food, I've done that. You know, mowing lawns, that sort of thing. Work construction. I've uh, done 10 years in the corporate world and been in the the church world and, and all the rest. But here's the thing. In different places, the bottom line is there's jerks everywhere. And it's rare to find people who work. Uh, it's hard to find people who are honest and keep their word and don't cut corners. That is really tough to find. And when this was written here, it's written, it says, to bond slaves, you know, to bond servants. And, and, and in that time, a third of the Roman Empire were slaves. And sometimes people have gotten so hung up on this that they miss the principle. The Bible is not supporting slavery here. It's not saying slavery is a good thing. It's just simply recognizing reality, which I love about the Bible. It doesn't like live off in some world that doesn't really exist. It just says, hey, this is the reality. There's bond servants out there, and there are masters out there, and this is how to deal with those things. They're not going to change tomorrow, so let's figure out reality and how to deal with it practically. So what he's saying here is whether you are the master or the slave, God is ultimately your boss, the boss of both, and he deserves your best wherever you find yourself. And, and you might say, you know what, they treat me like a slave at my job. Well, I doubt if they really do. I mean, they pay you probably. Even if you say it's minimum wage, it's not that much or something. But, you know, uh, they pay you and you're free to go. You, you could go. And you say, well, what else would I do? Well, you're still free to go. And so how much more, if this is a principle that applies to bond servants and to masters, many of them to be heathens, hey, This principle certainly applies to voluntary employment, which is what most of us are involved with. Now, this is what I want to really show you is that they build on each other because, see, obedience to employers, verse 5, really is birthed in the home. It's something that starts from the very beginning in verse 1 through 3 with the honoring of your parents. When you learn to deal with your parental authority, it's going to be really nice if you go out into the work world and, and have that already there. And sometimes with our kids, you know, we're teaching them chores, you know, and all the rest, 
It takes a lot longer to teach a kid to do something right than it just does to do it right yourself. But if you teach them to do it, well, someday they might actually do it. If you just do that for them, uh, what you're teaching them to do is to, to have other people serve them. And so sometimes with our kids, I'll say, hey, if I were your boss, I would fire you. But because you're my kid, I won't fire you, but I'm just going to try, you know, we're going to try this again, you know, but... But I, I want them not to get their first job and have it for a day because they don't know how to, uh, you know, to submit to authority. And so we're teaching our kids, even as they're in our home, hopefully, to learn to be good employees someday. And one of the things he talks about here is eye service. What's he talking about with eye service? That's when a person is working while you're watching, you know, working while you watch, but the minute... You're not watching, back to playing solitaire. You know, there's a lot of people out there that solitaire and alt-tab is their favorite key to be hitting. Here comes the boss, alt-tab. You know, you can do it fast. Spreadsheet, you know, numbers all up there. Hmm, yeah, back to king. King and the jack goes here and this. Ooh, you know, here he comes again, alt-tab, you know. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, you know what? If you're working for the boss, you may pull one over on the boss, but remember, he says, as to Christ, as to the Lord. It's never really solitary, you know, you're never really alone. And so lest anyone think that the boss gives, being the boss gives you freedom to do whatever you want, you say, man, I wish I was the boss instead. Well, you know what? He's got word to them too. Verse 9, he says, you masters do the same thing to them. Giving up threatening, knowing that your own master is also in heaven and there's no partiality with them. What's it saying there in the scripture? Every boss has a boss. Every person has a boss. And ultimately, God is not impressed with position. He's impressed with integrity, honesty, diligence at whatever level somebody is. If they are the employer, great. If they are the employee, great. God expects to, the employers to treat employees as well as they possibly can. And even if they don't, well, he says employees ought to work as hard as they possibly can. In order to be in order in this area, regardless of whether you're the boss or the employee, you just got to remember a simple thing, which is I work for a Jewish carpenter. Jesus is my boss. And so that means we work with him wherever we are. It means we work like him wherever we are. It means we work for him wherever we are, you know. And if God moves you on, great. But until he does, you do your best work wherever you are, even if you're working with jerks. And so the importance of order, of submission, of respect, of obedience is hard to miss in this section of Scripture. And that's where it, it comes to this conclusion. I think you're going to really uh, be interested in how this ties together, verse 10, because it's a familiar passage, but I love to look at it in context of the chapter. He says there, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So he's coming to a conclusion. Of course, we are too here. As Paul switches to the illustration now, not of the home or not even of the workplace, but of a soldier, of a soldier in the midst of a war zone. And he says, you know what? Be strong in the Lord's power. Now you might say, why, why do I need to be strong in the Lord's power? Why, why do I need it? Well, if the two things we have already discussed haven't uh, already convinced you, man, I need the Lord's power to be a parent, to be a child, to be an employee, to be an employer. I, I need that. I need help. But on top of that, all of these things, things take place in a war zone. See, and if you've ever been in the military or you were brought up by military parents, you know, one of the things uh, that you know probably is they were pretty precise. They're pretty ordered, you know, pretty uh, everything in its place and a place for everything and all that. Why? Why is there so much structure in the military? Why is there so much emphasis on respect and honor and submission? Because it's a dangerous spot. It's because orders disobeyed means lives lost. And when war zones are chaotic, and they always are, there has to be order. There has to be order among the soldiers. If there isn't, there's going to be a lot of problems. Marching orders have to be followed immediately without question, without uh, debate, without, well, I don't know if that's such a good idea. And so without those things, there can only be death and defeat. But with things in order, that's when you're going to see a victorious armory, army. And that's what you see in verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So again, just thinking about the contrast that we've seen, you know, the in order, out of order. Well, in order, if you want an in order life, this is what you're going to need to be in armor and on guard, in armor and on, on guard. Not enough even to have the armor on and be asleep at the wheel. 
but in armor and on guard. And then out of order is going to be unarmed and off guard. You know, casual, you know, beach attire here out in the middle of a war zone. Oh, there's a war? I didn't realize that. Boom! Oh, whoops. Well, I know it now. Now, why do we need armor? Again, just a simple statement. If you see that, you go, the whole armor of God. Why would I need armor? <laughs> because we're at war. With whom? Well, verse 12 says it. The devil and his demons. It gives a long uh, description of that, but that's what it's talking about. And if ever there was someone who's an example of someone who is totally out of order, somebody who is the author of chaos and all that, it is the devil. And the thing that, to know is that once he was on God's side, in fact, he was at God's side. The Bible describes him as a powerful angel who was once one who certainly had God's agenda as his agenda. But at some point, the devil decided, you know, I don't like taking orders. I don't like the marching orders. I think I will march to my own drum. I'll do things my own way. This whole submission thing, I'm not on board with the mission. I want to do my own stuff. And so Isaiah 14, 13 says it this way. I will ascend. I will exalt myself. I will be like the Most High. You see certainly arrogance and lack of submission there. And there's two extremes in the church, of course. Too much emphasis on the devil and too little. I mean, those, both of those can get you into trouble. And so, you know, certainly not an, a, a desire here on my part to minimize him. Uh, the Bible says that he came to steal, to kill, destroy. 1 Peter 5.8 says he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may, he may gum a little bit. No, it says th who he may devour. You know, so if you, if you don't think you're at war, if you don't think there's a, a desire for your relationships and your, and your influence on the world to be devoured, for your kids to be messed up, for your family to be destroyed, well, you're not paying attention here. You know, Satan is, is not... Uh, you know, casual <laughs> toward you. And so it's also important to see on the other side that, that he's not God's op opposite equal. See, sometimes people think there's this great cosmic struggle and you've got God on the good side and devil on the bad side and they're equal and they're going like this back and forth. Listen, the devil isn't even in the match. You know, it's, it's like uh, when you get to see Ken Graves uh, in a few weeks, and, and he's a grappler, he's a wrestler, the real deal, not the, you know, fake, fakey, fakey stuff. This is the stuff where they just, you know, get in there and two brutes just bust it out. But if you think of him uh, and going against me, it would not be a real fair thing, but that's not even a, a comparison there to what we're talking about here. Uh, Satan is just a created being, a fallen angel, and he is far superior to us but he is far inferior to, inferior to God. And so he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at once. In fact, probably, I don't know for sure. I know I probably never had a personal encounter with him. It was probably some buck private somewhere, some new scrub that just signed up, you know, in the demon patrol who, who bugs me because I don't know that I rate uh, the devil's interest. But you see him talking about wiles of the devil. You know, the wiles of the devil. What does that mean in verse 11? It means he's crafty. It means he's subtle. And one of the things he loves to do, first of all, he loves to have people not think that he exists, but then if you believe in God, you believe in God's word, you certainly need to believe that there is a devil, a personal uh, evil that is against us very directly. And if you've been a Christian for more than a few minutes, you probably figured that out. But what you see is that he loves in his subtlety to get us fighting each other instead of him, you know. And this is especially true in families, you know, in, in, in church families, you know, our own personal family, but also in the church family here. And so, you know, he'll try and convince you that someone else is the enemy. You know, your kids are the enemy. Oh, man, the kids are ruining my life. Your spouse is the enemy. Your ex-spouse is the enemy. Your boss is the enemy. Your employees are the enemy. All of this. And what ends up happening so often in our lives is we fight the wrong war because we're fighting friendly, what's called friendly fire. What's friendly fire? That's when somebody in uh, your own troop shoots you instead of the enemy. You know, they're like, you're never going to win a war that way. And I try to remind myself constantly, you know, in our marriage, in our home, my wife is not the enemy. I mean, we'll start having a discussion. And I think, she's not the enemy. We have an enemy. And it's so much better instead of pointing our guns at each other to start saying, you know what? Let's get together on this one. Point our hearts to God 
and ask him to beat this guy for us. And that's what you see. No, no soldier would willingly go to battle unarmed and unaware. And so what are our marching orders? Look at it in verse 13. He says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand on the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation the sword of the spirit which is the word of God now this is a whole Bible study in and of itself you could certainly go through each one of these and make a long series of it but what I want to do instead is just take some time to think about this one main thought here which is verse 11 it says stand Verse 13, it says withstand. It says stand again. Then verse 14, it says stand again. I, I'm not the, the sharpest tack in the drawer, but here's the thing. When I see things like that that are repeated like that, I start going, hmm. I know as a parent, I repeat the things that I think the kids need to hear. And so as a parent, I repeat the things that I think the kids need to hear. And so what you see here is God trying to tell us something. Stand, man. Withstand. How are you going to do that? What does that mean? That means somebody wants to knock you down. That means somebody wants to knock you out, out of order. He wants to chaos your life. And again, I mentioned James Dobson, but the focus on the family isn't just from the Christian side. Oh, believe me, the devil is focused on the family. And the thing is that there are many unbelievers watching us too, you know? And one of the things they want to know is, does it work? Does it work? Yeah, you know, does... Putting things in God's order, does it make a difference in a person's life? And that's one of the things that I really take to heart where I say, Lord, help my life. In spite of the fact that there's going to be chaos, in spite of the fact that there's going to be pressure from the inside and the outside, by your grace, Lord, you've got to bring order to our lives because I want our lives to look different than other people's. I want you to strengthen us to stand because there's going to be an evil day in everybody's life. Maybe more than one, but he talks here about the evil day. And see, our friends, our family, and even strangers are walking, watching to see if it works. And for their sake, as well as my own, you know what? When the going gets tough, that's a time when I got to be able to stand. And there's only one way to do it. See, there are certain days in our life, again, there's the beautiful days, you know, where everything's fine. But the Bible said that there would come times when the winds and the waves would beat against a house. And you would find out what the foundation is. And those can be a lot of different things. You know, those can be financial things. Those can be problems in a marriage. You know, just times where there's friction or times when the kids, maybe one of them's having trouble or starting to stray or whatever else. And those can be very difficult times. A sickness comes in. All of these different things can bring a real heat to a life. And you know what? It's a bit late at a time like that to start thinking, now, where were those storm shutters? Uh, you know, I wonder if it's time to build in a good foundation here. No, it's really tough at that time when the storm's already started. And see, I've been a believer long enough now to see casualties in the war. And it's one of the things, you know, it, they say in wars, you, you, you got to get used to that. It's part of what it is, you know. But I have seen casualties of war, and maybe you have too, and I don't like that part. <laughs> I don't like that part at all. Destroyed lives and fractured families, and it's no joke to see someone who was once really doing great sort of off spiritually in a corner with an out-of-order sign on them, just looking broken down and busted out because, hey, somehow in the evil day, they didn't stand. And especially, this breaks my heart because I know how preventable it is. In my own life, in their life, in every life, there's a dependence on God that we have to have in this armor of God. That's all it's saying here. He's saying the things that come with Christ, those are the things that you need in your life. The righteousness that comes from him, the salvation that comes from him, the gospel of peace, that you have peace even in the midst of everything and you can share that with other people. All of these things, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. God provides the armor, but we have to take it on, put it on. That's what it says here. And it's interesting because I know, you know, nothing wrong with this concept, but I know people who say every morning I pray and put this on. Actually, scripture, I never see a place where you're supposed to take it off, you know, so I put it on and leave it on, sleep in it, you know, well, sleep in the armor. Hey, it's spiritual, it won't bother you. But here's the thing, the belt of truth, all of these things, those are the things that bring a life into order. We've heard a lot of truth tonight, and the main thing is to ask the Lord by his Spirit to bring those truths and to actually help us put them into practice. 
See, it's really, really true that Jesus won the war, you know, but there's still a battle going on because disputed ground is still out there. You know, there are still lives that the decision is, hey, is that going to be in a, a life that's in order or that's going to be a life that's out of order? Is that going to be a life that, that marches to the tune of God or that's going to be a life that goes the other direction? Because, you know, Satan knows his time is numbered, his days are numbered, but he's going to try and take as many down with him as he can. He knows he's on his way down. It's kind of like a guy going into the swimming pool and it's like he knows he's going in, but he says, I'm not going in alone. I'm not going into that lake of fire alone. I'm going to take as many as I can with me. And there's an old military phrase that, hey, soldier, when you get shot, the war's over. You know, I mean, your side may still win, but when you get shot, the war's over. There's always that personality to it, the personal part. And so thinking about that, a question to consider. Yes, Jesus has won the war. But what about you? What side of this struggle are you going to be on? Are you going to be able to stand strong? Am I going to be able to stand strong? Will my kids do that? Will my family do that? Will my friends do that? Will the people in this room do that? Well, God has certainly given us the equipment, the energy, the ability to, to stand strong. That's what he's saying here. But he doesn't want to see anybody with an out-of-order sign around their neck spiritually. But the safest place to be in, in this war is certainly in the front lines. You see that in the life of David and Bathsheba. You know, here's David, a king who'd been in many wars and survived many of them, but the, the spiritual war that he really lost and is most known for messing up was one where it said all his men were out at battle and he stayed home. Hey, pretty safe. What could go wrong here? And then he spies another man's wife out on a roof taking a bath, Sheba, and the rest is a sad history story in his life. And that's why you look at these things and say, you know what? I can't afford to be unarmed and unaware. If you say, I'm going to run from the battle, guess what? The battle will find you. And that's why you need to pray always, verse 18, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And Paul finishes it out with such a plea here. It's great. He says 19 and 20, verse 19 and 20. As for me, pray that the utterance would be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were in prison, I know what I'd be saying. Lord, may the lock be out of order. You know, tomorrow morning when I wake up, may I see a little out of order sign on the lock and it boom, and the doors are open and all the rest. But that's not the focus of Paul's prayer. He says, you know what? May my life be in order. May my mouth be ready to speak. May my witness not be out of order. Let me not chicken out. He was about to go before one of the great maniacs of history, uh, Nero, who would probably put, try to put him to death. And he knew that. And so he says, well, you know what? My life's in order and, and help me not to get chickened out when the time comes that I would be able to be a witness. And then he goes on to just say, hey, may all these things be known to you by this guy Tychicus. Let me read it with you, the, the greeting at the end of the letter. These were personal letters, and so you see him saying, I've sent him, verse 22, for this very purpose, that you may know what's going on in our life, that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. So that's the end of the book of Ephesians. And I just want to leave us with a couple of thoughts here uh, as we part, which is the first one. In an out-of-order world, uh, we face a real important decision. Paul was in a very chaotic place, you know, prison, a wicked town in many ways, uh, heading off into an uncertain future, but he had peace. His life was in order. He knew where he was headed. He knew what his life was about here. He knew what it was about when it was over. And so the question comes to each one of our lives, hey, is my life in order? You know, do I have the priority straight? Do I have peace? Am I going to stand strong? And if you're a Christian here tonight, at least on one level, you can answer that. Yes, spiritually, you know, I'm in order. But, but practically, you can still come to that question. You know, we're God's children. We're God's children if we have given our lives to Christ. And one of the things that I see in that is, you know, it says children obey. And, and so God, in some ways, has probably given even the adults of any age in here some warnings. He certainly did me as I looked at these things. And I've noticed that my kids, our kids, always get hurt right after a warning. It's a weird dynamic. 
Our kids will be jumping on the bed, jumping on the bed, jumping on the bed, and I say, hey, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. And if they keep doing it, right then they get hurt. It's amazing. It's like I, I, I was there to warn them, and if they don't heed the warning, they get hurt. And God so often in my life has sent me a warning, and I say, eh, I don't need, thanks. You know, second or third time, maybe I'll listen. But it's amazing how if he said something to you tonight to warn you, hey, it's a war out there, don't take it lightly. Well, you know what? It's easy to get out of order. The, the letter to the Ephesians, the, the church in Ephesus actually got out of order. Uh, it, it was a great rock in church when, it, when Paul wrote this to him. And yet 30 years later in the book of Revelation, Jesus has a word for him. He said, guess what, guys? You got out of order. <laughs> it, it took some time, but, it, but slowly and, and without even you noticing it, what happened is you left your first love. And you were doing all kinds of things and you were all excited, doing the right stuff, but just lost the connection to Christ. And so the solution, he said, man, go back and do the first things. And so maybe that's a word to some folks here today that, you know, it's really easy to get out of order and just say, Lord, I need it back. But maybe you're here tonight and in a much more profound way, your life's out of order. Why? Because you don't have Christ at the center. You don't have him first. And that's the thing. The word shows us so clearly why a life doesn't work if a life doesn't work. It can't work as designed because we were designed to have Jesus at the center of our life. And when that's not true, nothing else will work. Without God in the proper place, you can just stick a big sign on your life that says out of order. And you can kick it and you can do things to it and shake it and try and get it to work and it's never gonna work until you get the right thing first. And having your, your life out of order like that spiritually is more than a minor inconvenience. It's more than just a, oh, well, I'll try something else. No, it's a major catastrophe. And so this here is good news that God can fix you and he wants to fix you, but you have to come to him and just simply say, I'm out of order. So we're going to close tonight's service just with a, a simple invitation. Uh, we're going to close our eyes, bow our heads. And if you're here tonight and you know that your life's out of order, you can look at it and say, you know, maybe even outside it looks very orderly, but inside it's chaos and disaster. It's without form and void, you know. Well, God was able to speak into the world and bring order out of chaos, and he can do the same to your life, but you have to give your life to him before he can fix it. He can't fix it from afar. He says, I'm going to fix it from the inside out. So let's pray, and at the end of that prayer, if there's anyone here in this room that needs to commit their life to Christ, I'm just going to ask you to do that by raising your hand. Father, I thank you for uh, these words here of warning. They are given by you as our Heavenly Father who loves us so deeply that you would even be willing to discipline us and risk uh, us misunderstanding that along the way to save our lives, to put us on the right path and to keep our lives in order. And I pray for anyone here tonight. Maybe there is somebody here tonight who knows deep down that their life's out of order because you're not in it. And that they have tried to be independent from you, but they're coming to you tonight with an honesty by your Holy Spirit to give their life over to you.